Airgrid have announced a five-year partnership extension for the GEA official timing sponsorship. Airgrid is a state-owned company that manages and develops Ireland's electricity grid to deliver a cleaner energy future is now in its sixth year as the official timing partner of the GAA. And as part of this announcement, I'm delighted to welcome three-time All-Ireland winning player and All-Ireland winning manager with Kerry Eamon Fitzmaurice to the show. Eamon, how are things? Hi, Owen. How's it going? Uh, do you wish you were in a championship dugout this weekend? You getting jealous? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose, the, look, the, it's easy to miss it. Um, the championship weeks, and particularly the week of a game and the, you know, the when all the hard work is done, really, and it's only a matter of tuning up and looking forward to a big game in Killarney. So, uh, yeah, easy to miss that that aspect of it. But in terms of all the work and um, preparation that goes into getting to this point, I don't miss that part of it. Mm. How long does it take for you to, to truly reflect on being part of an intercounty setup for so long? Like, if you include the underage, the playing, the, the, the senior management... Uh, I guess it does take a little while to, to readjust to a life without intercounty football as, as a big part of it. It does. Um, I suppose. Look, my my looking back at my time involved with Kerry, from you know underage and playing and being involved in management, my take and it hasn't changed over the last couple of years. I still feel so lucky. And so privileged to have been involved, um, you know, first of all, as a player and to be selected to play for Kerry is such an honour for, for yourself and for your club and for your family. And um, to have won, you know, a couple of All-Irelands along the way was great. And similarly with the management then to be asked to be involved as, to, as a selector, first of all. And then as, a, as manager of Kerry, it's a, it's a huge honour and a huge privilege um, so I look back at my time very fondly, uh, really enjoyed it, really put everything into it. But at the same time, now that I've moved on from it, I'm enjoying life away from it as well. And, uh, you know, I, I had started a new job coincidentally when when I finished up with, with Kerry in 2018. I'd taken over as principal of the school here in public school, Kirkagina, and that's a big job and there was a steep learning curve in that for me. Um, and we have a young family at home as well. So I'm busy at home as well. So the time is filled and your time will always be filled. And uh, obviously I'm enjoying watching the games and looking in from the outside now. So, uh, you know, there's an adjustment, of course, there's an adjustment away from the habit and the routine of, of, of being on and being thinking about football so much. But your, your time is filled in other ways and, uh, and, and that's fine too. It's interesting, isn't it, that in Gaelic games, because there's such a local nature to it, that once you kind of manage your team, there's only a few scenarios where people go further afield and maybe manage a, a rival county or, or something like that, where almost after you've done it once, a lot of people kind of finish up then. So that there's a lot of expertise at inter-county level kind of not going back into inter-county level, if you know what I mean. And, and from your perspective, I guess you get the senior job when you're only 35 years of age, I think the youngest Kerry manager of, of all time. And I just wonder, is there ever a moment where you're like, I'd love to be able to build on what I have as an inter-county manager? Because I'm sure you finished up a better manager than how you started. Yeah, absolutely. Of course you do. And uh, you're learning all the time. And I, I still feel I'm learning. And I still, I think for the initial year out of it, um, I was... Uh, I was happy just to spectate and casually spectate really more so than anything else. Um, but in, in the last year or two, and certainly this season, I find myself being very interested again in everything that's going on. Um, you know, being interested in adding to my own kind of um, coaching development and my own coaching education. I find that that's happened naturally uh, again this year. Uh, but yeah, look, I think that's something that's always there. I'm lucky enough in my job that I'm able to be involved with school teams all the time and I, and mm. I love being involved at that level. Uh, it's harder to get involved with my club at the moment when I'm, you know, living uh, away from North Kerry and um, working in the job I'm working in. But being able to be involved in the grassroots at schools level is very enjoyable. We haven't had football, unfortunately, 
since you know March 2020 in schools, but hopefully we'll have it back now in September and uh, I'll stay involved in that. So, you know, there's always opportunities to be involved there if you, if you so wish, but um, the inter-county thing is a huge commitment and it's a huge uh, commitment for everyone in your life. It's a commitment for, for, for you, obviously, but it's also a commitment for your wife, your family, you know, your, your extended family, kind of everyone's nearly involved in it really because there's so much goes into it. So there's, there's a lot to be considered when you're getting involved in it. But um, at the moment, I'm happy where I am. I'm happy looking on and uh, enjoying supporting, supporting the Kerry lads. And how are you broadening your horizons then on a coaching level, as you mentioned there? Is it just from a bit of training here and there and, and, and watching as many games as possible? Or, or are you tapping into other resources as well? Watching and I'm starting to read a bit again, which I hadn't been doing. And uh, the appetite is there to possibly start attending coaching conferences and things like that again, which wasn't. It just genuinely wasn't there for a while. Um, I suppose I had spent uh, so long at it that uh, I needed a bit of a, a break from it. And even just to refresh my mind and re- refresh uh, my thinking on the game and everything, I felt that it was good to take a bit of a step back and uh, allow, allow that hunger to return naturally and uh, and it has and i and i'm enjoying doing that and i'm enjoying doing the bit of reading and stuff at the moment and uh uh you know just getting getting the brain ticking over in, in that way again anything good that you'd recommend on the reading front um anything good <laughs> there's uh yeah there's plenty of stuff um a, a book i had read at the time and i'm rereading at the moment is uh uh Pochettino's book he did with um Guillaume Balaga uh, when he was in Spurs, I remember at the time I read it, and it was a kind of a speed read, but there was there was some good insights in it. So I'm rereading that. I read um, Kevin Welch's book recently. Uh, very good insight, a lot of good stuff in that, and uh, very honest and open book. In fairness to to, to Kevin, and I enjoyed that read. So um, they are kind of the two that I, I have on the go at the moment, but. I'm sure I'll dip into other stuff when I'm off over the summer. The, the Pochettino thing is fascinating, isn't it? The way, I guess, he took a, a club from a, a fairly decent level and all of a sudden got them to a whole other level when it came to their commitments, to the, to the meters they were running on the training pitch. A lot of fellas were ruthlessly cut from that team. Like, that is straight off, I, I'd imagine, a, a Bible for any coach out there in terms of how you can make measured improvements as a coach. Yeah, I think, yeah, absolutely. And I just think done in a very... Uh, exact but caring way as well mm. and that that certainly comes across in the book and uh, once once you were once you were with him uh, he'd do anything for you but he wasn't afraid to take the hard decisions either and uh, just all the different experiences he had himself both as a player and as a, a manager feeding into his coaching style and um, yeah it's a good it's a good read and I'm enjoying it and you know, like I said, I remember reading it at the time. I think it probably came out maybe September, October 2017, around that time. I remember. Yeah, see, the season was in flow, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I remember reading it back around that time. And, uh, you know, like I said, at the time, it was a, I kind of shot through it, but I'm reading it uh, a, a bit more measured this time and probably taking in more of it. You're not a Spurs fan, are you? I'm not. No, I'm a, I'm a Man United fan. Right. What what can what can a GA coach learn from Ole Gunnar Solskjaer? Then do you think? <laughs> well, I think in fairness to him, and we're in a group of United fans, and we'd be debating back and forth. But I think one thing is he's certainly very good at tapping into the tradition of what Man United should be about, and I think he's trying to bring back um, basically the Alex Ferguson values and uh, things that might have been lost in the in the, in the meantime since Alex Ferguson finished up and might have been a bit diluted with all the chopping and changing that has happened uh, on the managerial front but I think he's bringing stability um, and I think he's in terms of his values and the way he looks at what Man United should be and should represent I like that side of it from the coaching perspective um, I'm still still looking to see what exactly is going on but uh uh, we'll give him more time and we'll see where that goes. That's it. And the thing about Solskjaer is that at any of those great moments during the season they just had, 
the crowd, if they were there, would have been unbelievable. Like because everybody, every Manchester United fan, I'd imagine, just really wants them to do well. So hopefully, yeah. from, a, from a United perspective, that comes into play uh, next season. Uh, Eamon, when it comes to the Gaelic football, then uh, like this season has already been talked up as the, the, the savior of modern Gaelic football. Is the hype real? Like, can we believe what we saw in the league with these big score lines and lots of kick passing and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, well, so far it is. Um, look, I think a big thing has been playing a league, uh, you know, later with with the pitch conditions, the, the air conditions, decent weather for a lot of the games. Um, in terms of will it continue for the championship? I think, look, even for a lot of the games, teams... Some teams were still setting up quite defensively. They were getting bodies behind the ball. But players were just playing excellent football. They were taking the right options. They were kicking huge scores. They were kicking scores from out the field. Um, They were getting through defences, even if there was plenty of bodies back there, with pace, with good movement, with one-twos, with good just good football. So I I think there's... um, you know, while there is still strong defensive structures in place by some teams, I think teams are getting better and better at picking holes in it. I think players are becoming more and more accurate. And uh, they're probably getting the ball to the to the shooters and to the best shooters more often. Um, so, yeah, it augurs, it augurs well. And it's been, the league has been outstanding and there's been brilliant football across all of the divisions. So hopefully it'll continue now for the summer. One of the things that seems to be popping up is that teams are now realizing that the full court press is almost a necessity in, in a lot of games. Are you seeing this as a more aggressive press even from, uh, say, 2016 in, the, in that semi-final where you guys really would have done it to Dublin that year? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's constantly evolving. And uh, obviously when we tried that that day, that was extreme and it was new and it, it worked. But we, unfortunately, we didn't get the opportunity to do it more in the second mm-hmm. half. Um, but teams have tweaked us and, you know, for us starting off that day, it was a kind of a static enough zone in terms of that the players were getting to a zone and they were kind of staying within their zone. But more and more teams now are getting ready, are getting better at it being a moving zone and adjusting as the keeper is kicking and making it even harder for the goalkeeper. So there's constant tweaks going on with it. But, um, you know, all teams have figured out really that it is risk reward, but the risk, you know, or the reward far outweighs the risk from the point of view that even if you lose the kick out, you still have time to get bodies back. Um, once it isn't a boomer over the top and you can get caught, caught open. And some teams are trying that. And in fairness to goalkeepers like Rory Began, um, Niall Morgan, you know, f- Sean Patton, fellas that have a big boost and that can kick us. 70 and 80 yards they're trying that and you'd probably see a couple of goals from that over the summer but um, I think overall teams are being rewarded for pressing like that and um, we'll, we'll probably see more and more of it for the summer The moving zone is, is very interesting like I, I know we, we might be at risk of like getting into too much of the nitty gritty here but does that change the type of player you would be looking for as a coach in, in your forward line then? Is it, does it just favour more athletes again? It, it doesn't, it doesn't. I think, look, all players are so athletic now and they're so, you, you see very few, you know, players that aren't able to move. So if 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 at all, they're all so athletic and they're so, um, you know, mobile and and agile as well. So I, I yeah, no, I think that uh, teams, you know, particularly when they get the press on and when, like I said, when they're moving around and when they're being, that bit of flexibility is coming into us. Uh, it's exciting to watch and I think look again when we get the crowds back to games it's certainly a thing that will get people off their seats and uh, I think everyone likes it unless you're the poor goalkeeper and you're after losing two or three in a row and you're trying to figure a way out of this uh, but uh, you know it's something I mentioned in in, um, in an examiner column I wrote earlier on the year I'm looking for the next step in it now rather than the, the team that are pressing what's the next step in terms of beating the press and I'd love to see something like an overload going the opposite direction if you know what I mean if, if the team taking the kick out are taking the risk that they're loading it up the other way and that they're leaving players inside you know that if you've three or four in the full forward line and you're just letting them there because you know yeah. it's going long and you know it's going to a certain part of the field and if you lose it then you're trying to adjust uh, I think there's something in that 
but I'm I'm looking forward to seeing, like I said, who's going to be the one to to bring the next step in terms of breaking a press. I think there's only so much more you can do in terms of setting the press and the kick out, but breaking it going the other way will be is the interesting thing for me at the moment. Right. We'll keep we'll keep an eye on that over the next little while. Like I guess Kerry to a point have got caught on that on a number of occasions. It happened once against Ross Common, the most obvious example, obviously, Con O'Callaghan uh, against Dublin. Is that then where you would pick as a weak point in Kerry's title charge this year? Yeah, again, look, that's the that's the risk reward yeah. thing. And if you're look, I think against Dublin, they're so good if you give them all their own kickouts and if you don't at least push push up and contest some of them and possibly that's the way it approaches it is it is it is a mix. But um I think unless you're giving them and unless you're giving them some problems in their own kick out, you're not going to win the match. It's as simple as that. They're too good. And if you're giving them uh fifty percent of the ball straight off off their own kick out, they're they're gonna beat you and they're gonna beat you pulling up. So I think you have to go after it. But that's the beauty of the league and that's the beauty of uh, mistakes like that happening um, you know there'll be tweaks and Peter Keane and the management team will be looking at that if this happens again this is the way we're going to deal with it and that's the beauty of having matches and having the context of matches to improve and stuff and that's one of the most enjoyable things of being involved with a team or managing or coaching a team is seeing those things trying to fix it if it happens again that you have fixed it um, and uh, it's just making you stronger all the time it does seem, when it comes to Kerry, um, and that there is now a, a cohort of players like Dermot O'Connor and Dara Moynihan who aren't just fit to make the 15. They're fit to make a real mark in big games this year. Is that the way you see it? And, and how important will that be later in the summer? Yeah, big time. And look, I think the, you know, the players from the successful minor teams now are, are starting to really put their stamp on the team. And... Um, you know, going up to the lads from the 2014 team, which would be the likes of Brian O'Bealglia, Tom Sullivan, those lads, back to the younger lads then. They now are there a couple of years. You know, Tom and Brian and them are there since 2016. So they've, they have a lot of experience in terms of being involved in the squad and then getting into the team. Uh, the likes of Dara Minahan and uh, uh, Dermot O'Connor. Dermot started the All-Ireland replay in 2019, mm. which was a huge experience for him. And he's continued to develop. And he, look, he's going to be a fantastic player for Kerry. And he had a, he had a brilliant uh, league this year. And hopefully he'll continue on into the championship. Similarly with Dara Minahan, you know, he's a, um, a real type of player you'd want on your team in terms of he'd do the hard work. He can be abrasive. He'll win breaks. But he's also excellent on the ball and he'll get scores for you. So it's great to see those fellas now um, with experience under their belt, probably more comfortable now as well, uh, starting and knowing that they can contribute. And uh, like I said, hopefully that will continue on into the championship and that uh, if and when Kerry get to Crow Park, that they'll be, they'll be really ready for that, those battles at that stage. And they've got as tough a Munster Championship as you could possibly ask for. It should be Clare, Tip, then Cork. Like people will say this is Yerraism or whatever, but I mean, that is as tough as you could possibly ask for throughout the, the Munster Championship. And you would assume, and it is an assumption, that the ghosts of last year will ensure that there won't be any complacency in, the, in those three games. Yeah, and look, I think in fairness to, to the lads last year, I don't think complacency would have been a factor. I think it was a poor performance on the day, and that can happen. Hmm. Um, I think the days of complacency are gone going back to my own time when we were involved whether it was Clare or Tipperary or Limerick or Watford or whoever we were playing in the Munster Championship it was the same we prepared the same as if we were playing uh, Dublin it was, it, you know it was, it was as simple as that and of course you can't get into a player's mind and a player might expect to win a game or whatever but if they're not performing uh, they're going to be hauled off and we certainly you know would have prepared for every team the same way and I think, look, in Kerry, the, the lads, the management and the players are going to be thinking game by game, but their goal is to win the All-Ireland. It's as simple as that. It has to be, and it is. So if you want to win the All-Ireland in 2021, you couldn't have a better path uh, to, to, to Sam Maguire in terms of you're going to get three games in Munster, first of all, instead of two, which is fantastic. Clare are playing very well. 
they're always a sticky wicket. I do think Fitzgerald Stadium mm. is a factor. Generally, Kerry, I think the last time we played them there, my last year in 2018, I, I think we scored more than 30 points that day. I think we kicked a huge point total that day. Um, but when we played them in Cusick Park, it's always tough. But after mm. the league they've had and they've improved again this year, they're going to be a tough game. If you win that, you're away in Semple Stadium to the Munster champions who've had a bad league campaign and who are going to be very, very anxious to make a big statement that it wasn't a flash in the plan. So that'll be a big test. Kerry come through that. You've Cork and Killarney who beat them last year. So there are three great games. You go to Crow Park, you're playing the Ulster champions. Regardless of who comes out of there and it's hard to call it, they're going to be well battle-hardened battle and that's going to be another test for Kerry. And if then you beat them and you earn the right to be in an All-Ireland final against Dublin from the other side, well, you're well tested and you're well ready. So I think from Kerry's perspective, um, the plan will be to win the All-Ireland. To win the All-Ireland, it's a brilliant route. But of course, that starts Saturday evening in Killarney and you have to perform in Killarney against Clare um, to make sure you get on to the next step. Absolutely. And while everybody will be well aware of that, my last question will probably undo all of that. Is there a chink in the Dublin armour from what you've seen so far this year? Um, I don't see them. Uh, I think every year since 2016, we've been hoping that there'd be a lessening of the hunger, um, that there would be signs of decay, but uh, I haven't seen it. Um, I think they went through the, 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 the league in third gear. They blooded a lot of new players without their manager being at the games with them. Um, they did what they had to do during the league. Um, can they be beaten? Of course they can. Of course they can. They, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're a brilliant team, but they can be beaten. To beat them, though, you have to get everything right in the day. To beat most teams, you have to get most right. And it'll do you, and you'll get away with a few mistakes. Against Dublin, you have to get almost everything right. And that's possible. A perfect performance is possible. But um, they still have, you know, as well as all the extra players that they've brought through, they still have brilliant man markers and the likes of Fitzsimons, Johnny Cooper. They still have James McCarthy. They still have Fenton. They still have Scully and Kilkenny going very well. They still have Conor Callaghan. So all of those players are playing really well. Um, and as long as, they've, uh, as they have those players, they'll be very hard to stop. They can be stopped, but you have to get everything right. Yeah, that's for sure. It's going to be a brilliant summer ahead. Just a reminder that Airgrid have announced a five-year partnership extension for the GAA official timing sponsorship. Airgrid are the state-owned company that manages and develops Ireland's electricity grid to deliver a cleaner energy future. And they're now in their sixth year as the official timing partner of the GEA. And as part of all of that, Eamon Fitzmaurice was speaking to us here on OTBAM. Eamon, great to chat to you as ever. Enjoy the football this weekend. Thanks, Owen.